your Bible to the book of Acts, chapter 1. We're walking through the book of Acts in these days, and I had great intentions to cover a large portion of Acts this morning. And that's not going to happen. Let's read from chapter 1, and we're going to read all the way through verse 14. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons fixed by the Father's authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem, from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. Let's pray. Father, would you please bless the preaching of your word this morning? Would you move in our hearts by your spirit? Would you transform us from the inside out, Lord, as our minds are renewed and as our lives are challenged to walk in the ways that you've called us to, to receive the empowerment that you've given us by your spirit, Lord, please help us this morning to hear and to be doers of your word. And it's in Jesus Christ name I pray. Amen. The main point of this text that we're looking at is as the disciples wait, they pray. As the disciples wait, they pray. Because what we're going to find out through all the book of Acts is that God's plans continue through prayer. Like God's plans for the world, God's plans for history, God's plans for the story of redemption, they happen through the prayers of his people. That's what he's invited us into. And so the disciples, as they wait for the coming of the Spirit, that's what's happening. Jesus has just ascended. He's just left them, and he said, wait in Jerusalem, because I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to you. And so they go to this upper room, this place in Jerusalem, this room. They walk a good, you know, three quarters of a mile away, get into this room, and they wait for the coming of the Spirit. We, uh, as Americans, we don't wait well. Uh, Checkout lines in the grocery store. Doctor's office waiting rooms. Road traffic. Restaurants 
and waiting. Amusement park lines. I'm sensing some stress levels rising in the room just by mentioning all these things. Because when it comes to waiting, we have a problem. And we're going to get to that. But when the disciples were given this opportunity to wait, they immediately resorted to prayer. Here's why we can't do a large portion of narrative this morning. Because I got to this one phrase in verse 14 where it says, All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer. And by the time I had finished really saying everything I wanted to say about that phrase, I didn't have any more space. It was, there's just so much there. So our sermon this morning, the time and the word that we're going to spend together is on this one phrase. All these, with one accord, were devoting themselves to prayer. There's three things that they're doing here. Notice they did not pull out their iPhones and start playing some video games, waiting for the Spirit to come. They didn't pass the time with Netflix. They didn't really have that option. So it's a, it's a bad illustration. But as they waited, they prayed. Here's what we learn about their waiting from this phrase. Their waiting was not passive. Their waiting was active in prayer. And their waiting was together. Their waiting was not passive. Their waiting was active in prayer. And their waiting was together. First, their waiting was not passive. They were devoting themselves to prayer. This word devotion is in the Greek, it's proskartereo, I think. <laughs> it is used many times in Acts to describe the exemplary constancy and persistence of the early church. It implies perseverance, devotion. If I could use an illustration from my life, devotion does not describe my workout routines. A day here, a month later, two days here, a year later, a few days there, check, Workout routine. That's not devotion. This devotion implies persistence and constancy and, and perseverance in something. Devotion more likely describes my use of coffee. I drink coffee every day. Yes, I get caffeine headaches if I don't drink coffee. I'm not proud of this. I'm just being honest with you this morning. I drink coffee every day. I study coffee. I seek out coffee shops and new locations I visit to taste test their coffee. I have my favorite spots in Savannah where I know where I can get my brewed coffee, my Americano, and my iced coffee. I'm devoted to coffee. And as long as that doesn't become an idolatrous devotion, it's not necessarily a bad thing. I'm sure there are things you are devoted to as well. As long as they don't take a higher place than your allegiance to Jesus Christ, there's room to really enjoy and be devoted to the things that he has created as gifts. But the disciples are described often as being devoted to what? What are they devoted to? They're devoted to prayer. And in this text, they're devoting themselves to prayer because they're waiting for the coming of the Spirit, but that waiting is not passive. Their, their waiting, secondly, was active in prayer. The early church devoted themselves to prayer because they understood that history was being overseen by God. And that his plans for his kingdom were going to come through the prayers of his people. God's plans for the world are continued and enacted through prayer. Everywhere you witness the book of the church and the book of Acts, they're praying. What are they praying? They're praying, your kingdom come and your will be done, just like Jesus commanded us to pray. Why would Jesus command us to pray a prayer if it wasn't through those prayers that he was going to bring his kingdom? Prayer is crucial to the advancement of the mission of God that we've been talking about from the book of Acts. 
And if we don't pray, then we, can't ex- then we should not expect God to move and bring in his kingdom. He told us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. Acts 2.42, you might be familiar with this verse if you've been around One Savior Church for very long. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of the bread, and the prayers. Did you know this morning, that's what we're doing? Like, we came together this morning to fellowship as a, as a koinonia group, as a, as, a, as a gathered people of God. We came here to devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching. We came here to break bread with one another and receive the the body and the blood of Jesus Christ through communion. And we came to pray. Here in this verse, they are not idly sitting by waiting for Jesus to go ahead and do this thing. Now, please, we need to contrast this, okay? Because when we, like, let's think about how this text and this example of the early church, how this connects to us. Who are we? We are Americans, right? And generally around in this room, it seems. Unless you're visiting from another international country, which if you're here, welcome. Um, We're Americans and we have a problem. I'm sorry, we do. We're busy all the time. We're busy all the time. And when we think of waiting... Our minds typically think of boring and wasteful, right? If I have to wait, that's boring and that's wasteful. Time is too precious to wait. I've got places to be, things to accomplish. I don't have time to wait. Can you imagine, like the church right now, I mean, this is a very unique time in the historical, what God's doing in history, but could you imagine just taking three to seven days off just to pray? Could, could we actually even consider that? Busyness is the air we breathe. Kevin DeYoung says this, He says, whether you are a pastor, a parent, or a pediatrician, you likely struggle with the crushing weight of work, family, exercise, bills, church, school, friends, and a barrage of requests, demands, and desires. No doubt, some people are quantitatively less busy than others, and some much more, but that doesn't change the shared experience. Most everyone I know feels frazzled and overwhelmed most of the time. We, make up, we wake up most days not trying to serve, just trying to survive. You ever feel like that? You ever feel frazzled and overwhelmed? Too many demands, too many things, too many, too many realities in life. Can't stop. I don't share this quote to make you feel guilty about your life and your busyness. The cultural busyness of our generation can feel like the water we swim in. I mean, what other choice do we have? Do we even have a choice? This is how the world is. This is, this is what it is. Welcome to America. I think we do have a choice, but that might be a sermon for another day. But today, I I really just want to focus in on the fact that the early church here in this text is devoting themselves to prayer in their waiting. And the question we need to ask ourselves is, what are we devoted to? What are we devoted to? Answer that in your head right now. What are you devoted to? If you want a more accurate answer to what you're devoted to that's not filtered through your own self-deception, then ask your spouse or your parents or a close friend what you're devoted to. I mean, here, we've got to ask this question. The disciples were devoted to prayer. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching. They were devoted to the fellowship. This this is a, this is, I think, is an example of how the church is to be. And so the question we need to ask our own hearts is what are we devoted to? 
And just, just one comparison and just, just one illustration of what this could look like. What if, this is just a big what if reality, okay? Hypothetical situation. What if we were more devoted to prayer than our phones? What if? I know, that, that this is crazy talk right now, right? But what if we were devoted more to prayer than to our phones? What if the first thing we did in the day was spend five to ten minutes in prayer before even looking at our phones? What if in the doctor's waiting room we prayed instead of playing games on our phones or scrolling through social media? What if the long checkout line at the grocery store became a blessing to us because it gave us more time to pray? What if traffic on the roads proved to be a grace of God for your soul? Because when you're stuck on the road, it doesn't matter how busy you are, you're not going anywhere. What if we saw that not as an inconvenience, but as a grace? Hey, I know you're really busy right now. Here's some traffic for you. You've got plenty of time to pray. And you can go to work and you can say, man, the roads are busy today. Sorry, I'm late. It's traffic. But it was a time to pray. What if in the car, what if we stop breaking the law by checking our phones and uh, not simply because we're just trying to be obedient earthly citizens, but because we actually are heavenly citizens so caught up in prayer and worship, it's not even a thought in our minds. You say, Ben, is it even possible to live this way? <laughs> Can, you, can we really live this way where we're so devoted to prayer that any opportunity of waiting within our life becomes an opportunity to pray? Could that really be true? Can we really live that way? Actually, you can't. <laughs> Have you guys ever tried to pray more? You guys ever just decided, I'm going to pray more? How long did that last? Not very long, right? I mean, I'm, not, I'm talking from experience here. I mean, I'm, I, mean I, could, I could tell you, like, the constant repentance of my life when it comes to lack of prayer. You and I are not capable within our own strength, within our own power, to say, okay, I'm supposed to pray. I'm going to pray more. If all you're doing is responding to the law that we should pray, you and I are not going to pray more. It will last very short. It will not carry through. You will not be devoted. You will not form that habit. And if you do, you're doing it to earn some kind of self-righteous status of being a praying person, not actually to pray for the kingdom of God to come. In every way, we are like the nation of Israel where we have great intentions, all that the Lord has commanded we will do. And then we get busy again, and we make excuses again, and the game on the phone is so much easier for a tired mind and a shriveled soul. We simply put are not capable of living this way. But Jesus did live this way. He, Jesus lived in a constant awareness of his Father. He devoted himself to prayer with lengthy prayer walks in the desert and a consistent father orientation to his life and every word. Jesus did because he was capable of living this way. He was capable of being devoted to prayer. And here's the crazy truth. You and I are not capable of living this way, but when your faith is in Christ, you are. Because your faith in Christ unites you to the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You and I can't grow in prayer if we're just trying to follow the command, you need to pray more. But you and I can grow in prayer if we are amazed and in awe and caught up in faith in Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ's life can be ours. That his death has paid for our prayerlessness. His death has covered the sin of our laziness. 
His death has, has covered the problems of our distracted minds. And he offers us resurrected life. He offers us freedom in Christ. He says, come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And so we say, Jesus, I can't pray right now. I can't even think. Jesus, my life is so overwhelming right now. I can't even handle it. But when you make that cry, you're praying. Prayer is our access point to the mercy and the grace and the rest of Jesus Christ. And your devotion to prayer will cost you some things, but it will give you access to life. Left to ourselves, we are hopeless. But in Christ, You and I, by the power of the Spirit, can be devoted to prayer. We're free to be devoted to prayer. The third thing that we see here, they were devoted in their waiting. They were active in prayer in their waiting. And then lastly, they prayed together. This was not an individual affair. They were waiting together, and so they were praying together. This text says that they were with one accord devoting themselves to prayer. This word is a very unique word used really by Luke alone. It's one other exception in Romans. In Luke's day, it was a political word that referred to the visible inner unity of a group faced by a common duty or danger. The unanimity, the un, yeah, I can never say this word. They were unanimous in that they were not based on common personal feelings, but on a cause greater than the individual. I, I think about Pirates of the Caribbean where, they, where he says, do we have an accord? You know, with one accord. With one accord, they were devoting themselves to prayer together. Listen, devotion to prayer is not just individual, although it is that. It is a recognition that we have a mission God has called us to. God's plans are going to continue through the prayers of his people. Our prayers together are going to continue the plans of God for his mission within Effingham community and beyond as we pray together. We have a mission, and so we must pray, and we must pray together because we are God's people. If you and I have signed up for this mission, then we as a church have a devotion that we are called to, a devotion to pray. Our feelings might not always be the same. Our experiences might not always align. Our opinions might be very different on many different realities. But we have unity with one another because of what Jesus Christ has done and in light of the mission he has called us to. There is so much diversity in this room as far as like opinions we have about all sorts of different things. I mean, we could talk all day about all the ways we think about life and view life and our worldviews and our belief systems and, and, and some of those things. There's a lot of difference in this room represented. But if we are in Christ... We have what Christ has done for us and the mission he has called us to as the aim of our unity. And so when we pray, we're not just praying for one another and the burdens and the the busyness and the overwhelmness. We are praying that God's kingdom would come and that his will would be done. That's why we gather, because there's a mission. That's why we pray, because there's a mission. The source of our unity is Christ, and the aim of our unity is the mission of God's kingdom in the world. Romans 12, 2 says, be constant in prayer. Colossians 4, 2 says, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. God's calling us to be a praying church, and he's empowering us by his spirit to walk in this praying way. And so here's our application for this morning really specific. (laughs) First of all, after the service today, Kelly Farabee is meeting 
with anyone in our church who is interested in being a part of a prayer team. Maybe you heard that announcement, maybe you haven't heard it yet. Maybe God's calling you to that prayer team. Maybe, maybe in response to this message and to the reality of what the early church is exemplifying for us and to what God is calling us into, maybe you need to join the prayer team so as to grow in prayer and so as to learn what it means to pray together with the church. If you are a person who has a passion to see the Spirit of God move in our church and you already have been praying that it would happen in extraordinary ways, then you need to be a part of this prayer team. If you are presently being convicted that you have not been praying for our church and for the mission of God through our church, then I encourage you as an act of repentance to join the prayer team and actively obey God's call on your life to pray. If you say, Ben, I've never really been a praying person. I don't even know how to pray. (laughs) Honestly, it scares me. Then you need to join the prayer team. Because the only way to learn how to pray is to pray. And the only way to learn to pray with one another, with one accord, is to pray with one another. So that's the first application. You have an opportunity this morning to obey God immediately, to be at a five, ten minute meeting after this service, to be a part of the prayer team, and to say, I want to be in a rotation of people who are going to be praying for our church. Secondly, our services are going to stop being so timed. There's not going to be a cutoff point for our services. You can now, from now on, you can come expecting to get out of here at some point. And it's not because I want to preach more. It's because we need to pray more. And if we don't have time, if we don't have space... I mean, did you feel it even when we took communion today and there was like this long extended time and you were kind of waiting for the line to come down and you'd already kind of exhausted yourself on prayer and you're sitting there and you're like, I don't even know what to pray for anymore. I'm just going to watch these people walking down to the communion table. Did you feel that? Here's the reality. We need to learn. We've got to grow in this. We've got to grow in when there's space and time to get, we don't need to be busy in this gathering. We want to cultivate an openness to the Spirit that does not attempt to put His work in our lives in a timed box of an hour and 15 minutes. This is going to be our unified outrage against the busyness of our lives and the constant expectations put on us. Now we might get out of 12, might not. My point is, when we gather into this space, On Sunday mornings, we want to gather not with an idea of uh, we've got places to be, things to accomplish, things to do, but let us sit in the presence of Jesus together. Let us come and find rest for our weary souls. Isn't it the complete opposite of what we need if we're always trying to do things in a right time frame? Your whole life is lived that way. You say, Ben, we eat lunch with our family and they go to a different church. Here's what you tell them. You say, we will be there when we get there. Don't wait for us. We always expect the Spirit to move in and among us when we gather because He indwells us. If He's moving and we're late, we will gladly eat cold food. You say, but Ben, there's children. Children, Ben. You have children. You know what this is like. Yeah, it is a real thing. You know, if, if the Spirit were to move in power, like we've never seen before, and Like, I mean, it's just like the Spirit is here. We are praying. We are unified. We are connected. If the Spirit moves like this and you have a baby, you still have to change the diaper. 
The movement of the Spirit of God does not take away from the practical realities that we're called to. You say, if the Spirit were to move, you you still have to change the diaper. You still have the two-year-old who's having an emotional breakdown. You still have the eight-year-old who just started not feeling well. I mean, these are realities of our life. So, here's what we do with that. Everybody knows the practical joy of having a date where your children are not present. Not because we don't like children. We love children. We need to have more children. Children are a blessing from the Lord. It is in the book. But children are children. They're born in foolishness. And the whole point of parenting is to raise them up in wisdom. It's to change what is foolish and turn it into wisdom. And so they're foolish children, and they need to be controlled, and they have lots of energy, and this is all good things that we get to be a part of as God's people. But we have child care for the children specifically so that we can have some space to be unrushed and undistracted as we pray, as we worship, as we sing. So listen, please hear me. When you are serving as a child on the child care rotation, a lot of the people in this room are, and there's others that are serving us right now. When you do that, you are not just doing a job. You're not just filling a spot. You're not just performing a duty. You are serving moms and dads so that they can pray. You're serving moms and dads so that they can be transformed by the preached word of God. You are serving moms and dads and so that they can be unrushed and undistracted in ways as they worship in the presence of God. That is a huge blessing. Your service to our church and taking care of children is making it possible for us to pray with one accord so that we can be about the mission of God. Your caring for babies is a time to pray for them children and to pray for our church. If you're on the nursery rotation, then you're on the prayer team. And when you're watching babies, you're praying for them, you're praying for our church, you're praying for the mission of God. If you're caring for the children, you're helping them reflect on the very heart of Jesus. And you yourself are reflecting the love of Jesus who had a heart for children. Jesus is the one who said, let the little children come unto me. Do not forbid them. Jesus was not a parent. He was a single guy. And yet he understood because he was so full of the love of God in him, love of God and love of neighbor, that he welcomed the children who everyone else said they're annoying, they don't obey, they're uncontrolled, they're foolish. And Jesus says, bring them to me. I'll show them grace. I'll show them mercy. I'll show them love. When you go and pick up your kids, if you're a parent in the room and you're picking up your kids today from the child care, can you thank those who are serving us in our church? Because they're making it possible for us to to hear the word, to pray to God in an undistracted way. We can do it when they're there, but there is a blessing when we can do so in a focused and undistracted way. With one accord, we are participating in something bigger than ourselves. Prayer, service, teaching, worship, mission, it's all a part of what we are called to be as the church of God. So here's what I want us to do. I'd like for you to bow your heads and close your eyes right now. We want to take our cue from the disciples in this time. And even though we're in a different historical point, the the reality of prayer and our devotion to it remains as the way the church exists in the world. So I want to ask you to repent of your prayerlessness, of your lack of understanding of what Jesus is offering you, the freedom to pray in faith. It's a process. We're we're going to be on a long obedience in the same direction, but we are going to do this together. So maybe your repentance will look like not checking your phone first thing in the morning, but spending time in prayer. Maybe your repentance will be coming to the prayer team meeting right after we're done here. 
Maybe your repentance will be participating as a servant in the child care ministry so as to serve the prayer and worship experience of our church body. Maybe your repentance is as a husband to say to your wife, we're going to pray together every night before we go to bed. What is repentance going to look like in your life? Please don't let this just be a sermon you hear this morning, but a sermon that is obeyed because this is the word of the Lord.